Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. The Lord bless everyone today in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our retreat. Thank you for touching lives, transforming hearts, doing good in every life. Thank you for the all sufficient Jesus who is sufficient for every need, every need in every life, every need in every family, every need in every community. And we're asking, Lord, today that your word, once again, as he reveals Christ more and more unto us, will have the greater benefit uh, manifesting in every life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. A good, good amen. God, God has blessed you. You can sit down. We're continuing in the revelation of Jesus from the scriptures. And today we're looking at Jesus, the great healer and helper interceding for every individual, every individual, everyone here, everyone, everywhere. Christ knows you. He loves you. And he intercedes, he prays. It takes your burden. It takes your request. It takes all the necessities you have. It takes it to the Father in prayer. That means he's interceding. He's also helping. And he's healing. And he's the great one that cannot fail. The great one whose power knows no limit. Jesus, the great healer and helper, interceding for every individual. We're told in Isaiah chapter 53, I'm looking at verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In verse 5, it says, but he he, Jesus, he, the one who is great, mighty, healing, helping, interceding, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. I am healed. Then in verse 12, he tells us, therefore, will I, the Almighty, therefore, will I, will I, God in heaven, divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul, Christ, Savior, Redeemer. He has put out a soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many. Look at this, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's the office of Christ, that's the ministry of Christ. He makes intercession for everyone on earth. Because everyone all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're told in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 25. Wherefore, he, Christ again, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. The only way to come to God the only way to touch the Father, the only way to reach the Father is that we come through Jesus Christ, seeing that he ever lived to make intercession for them. He ever liveth, he lives now. He's seated at the right hand of majesty, and he makes intercession for everyone. Verse 26, it says, For such an high priest, Became us, 
befitted us, answers to our need, such a high praise became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's the one we're talking about. That's the one we've been talking about in this retreat, the all-sufficient Jesus of death. Uh, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, G, Jesus is the good shepherd for sheep and for the saints. And H, Jesus, the high priest, helper of saints and of the seekers. G, and then the number three, Jesus, this is I, the interpreter of scripture to the sightless. The people who read and don't understand, sightless, spiritually. The people who go through the scriptures and they don't know it's for them. And they don't know the provision of the Lord and the promise of the Lord and the power of the Lord in their lives. They read but they cannot see, they cannot understand, they cannot perceive. Sightless. Jesus is the interpreter of scripture to the sightless. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at Jesus, the good shepherd. For the sheep and for the saints. In John chapter 10, reading from verse 11, I am the good shepherd. So clear, I am. No other one is. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. He is the good shepherd, he is the great shepherd, he is the glorious shepherd. We're told in Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 20, Hebrews 13, verse 20, now the God of peace will bring peace in your heart, peace in your family. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, then verse 21, make you perfect in every good work. To do his will, walking in you, that which is well pleasing in his sight, and he brought through Jesus Christ to who, to whom the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're looking at three things here concerning Jesus. Number one. He is the gift of God for all seekers of satisfaction. What you have does not satisfy. Material things do not satisfy. Earthly things do not satisfy. Earthly pleasure does not satisfy. Earthly property does not satisfy. That's why. Christ Jesus has been saved at the gift of God for you, for me, for everyone seeking satisfaction. Number two, he is the governor who suffered for all his subjects. The governor who suffered for all his subjects. Number three, he is the giver of the spirit for strength. When he's strained, strength to stand, stand firm. Strength to stand, stand uncompromising. Strength to stand, stand in the word, in the will of God. We need strength, the strength to be steadfast in the Lord. And he is the giver of the spirit for our strength. Look at number one. The gift of God for all seekers 
or satisfaction. In John chapter 4, reading from verse 10, Jesus was talking to the woman. He could have been talking to you. And what he says to one, he says to all. What he said to her, he's saying to you. Look at what he said in John chapter 4 verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, as he saying unto you, If thou knewest the gift of God. Was telling the woman, you are talking about water, you are talking about bucket, you are talking about having the rope to put the bucket in the well and draw the water. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him the gift of God and he would have given thee living water living water the gift of god is the gift of god to you we don't earn a gift it's out of the love of the giver that he gives us that gift it says in verse 14 in verse 14 but whosoever drinketh of the water that did this water that i shall give him the giver, the gift, and I give him freely. He shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. As we receive him today, as we accept him today, as we abide and remain in him today, this gift of everlasting life will be yours in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, not of your labor, not of your earning, not of your religious city, not of the good works that you have done, not of claiming to be this or that. It is not of yourself. Salvation is not what you can dig up by sweating and laboring. Salvation is not what you can get on the top of any mountain by exercising yourself. It is the gift of God. And I pray that gift of salvation, of forgiveness, of freedom from sin, of power over sin, the Lord bring to every life in Jesus' name. But you must know it is not of the labor of my hand or anything I could do. But my tears forever flow. And my zeal no respite, no. Could I labor and labor and say I'm searching, seeking for eternal life. All this for sin cannot atone. Thou and thou alone must save. You come to the Lord to have the gift, the gift of eternal life. He'll give you in Jesus' name. And then in Romans chapter 8. Reading from verse 32, that he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, everyone, from that side to that side, everyone, the Lord has counted you in. And you are in. Because he gave Christ for us all, for the low, for the high, for the sinful, for the good-natured, for the big, for the small, for the one on ground here, for the one everywhere, everywhere you find yourself. Christ is the gift of God for you, and it will satisfy you to the fullest in Jesus' name. He that, sp that spared not his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, 
freely, freely give us all things. All things are yours. All things spiritual. All things supernatural. All things strengthening. They are yours in Jesus. Number one is the gift of God for all seekers of satisfaction. Number two here. Number two, he is the governor who suffered for all he subjects. Think about that. That he suffered for you. As you come, as you surrender, as you submit, as you are subjected to him. And you say, he is my Lord. He controls me. He is my Lord. He directs me. He is my Lord. I am his and his forever. For all those who surrender, submit unto him, it becomes the governor of your life. Hey, look at him now in prophecy in Psalm 22. I'm reading from verse 1. You recognize him here. He is the one that the psalmist is talking about. In Psalm 22, reading from verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are the exact words he spoke on the cross of Calvary. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Look at verse 16. In verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. And it says the assembly of wicked men, of the wicked, have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's talking about Christ when he was crucified on the cross of Calvary. They pierced my hand and they pierced my feet. They nailed him to the cross. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, they patch my garments among them. You understand? He's talking about Jesus, what will happen to him. More than a thousand years before that thing happened, the word of prophecy was written, was uttered, that he will come and he will be the substitute and the sacrifice for the sin of every sinner. And he cancels every other sacrifice because the sacrifice is final, the sacrifice is full, and the sacrifice gives us a fellowship with the Almighty God. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. What's the conclusion of all that? That Christ died for you, that Christ suffered for you, that Christ gave himself. Fully on the cross of Calvary. What's the conclusion? Look at verse 28. In verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among nations. He rules, he reigns. That's why he is Lord. And when you accept him as Savior, you also accept him as Lord, as the governor. He is the governor among nations. And as he governs our lives, as he controls our lives, he sets us free from everything that had bound us in the past. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 22. But now, be made free from sin. Who makes us free? A Savior, a Lord, who is the governor of everyone that come to submit, to surrender absolutely unto him. Because he says, but now, be made free from sin. Sin of every type. Private. Public, common sin, habitual sin, every form of sin, those degrading sins, and the sins of 
the people that are well known that you know people don't even think about that anymore because it's a great man committing great sin and you know everybody now comes to accept that is acceptable to them but christ jesus savior lord is the one that came to set us free from every kind of sin common uncommon habitual daily whatever human the lord has come to set you free and what he sets you free from you're not being bondage to that thing anymore in jesus name now being made free from sin and become servants to god ye have your fruit unto holiness now we have the fruit of holiness we have the consequence of holiness we have the result of holiness by the redemption of the lord that's why god says follow peace with all men and uh, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And blessed are the pure in heart, the holy in heart, for they shall see God. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, who shall dwell stand in his holy mountain, they that have clean hands and a pure heart. Now, that's what Christ has come to do. He came to save us from sin. And to grant us the experience of holiness in the heart, holiness in the life, holiness in the tongue, holiness in our speech, holiness in our behavior, holiness in our character. But now, be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit. If you are born again, ye have your fruit. If you are connected with Christ, ye have your fruit. If you have been saved by Christ and you are subjected, surrender to Christ, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, the end result, and the end, the consequence, and the end, what you look for on the final day, everlasting. Like we're looking at number three here. He is the giver of the spirit for strength. When you are tired, you don't have strength. What can you do? When you are tired in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, what can you do? When you are tired after you have been running and running the race, what can you do when you are tired? But then, when you are tired, fight out. When you are tired, exhausted, he, Christ Jesus, is the giver of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that's the Spirit that comes to give you strength. When you looking at Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 32, this Jesus has God raised up. Whereof we all are witnesses. And then in verse 33, it says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. And then in verse 38, it tells us, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, turn around, change your mind, turn away from the old perspective, the old tradition, the old religion, and the old covenant, and turn to the Lord, repent, turn around, Look at Jesus face to face and see that he, the risen one, is now the redeemer. And through him, the Father, God in heaven, gives the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name, by the authority of Jesus Christ. For the remission, removal, the cleansing, the freedom from all sin. And ye shall receive 
the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then he says in verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children. The promise is unto you and to your children. The promise is unto you and to your converts and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He has called me. He has called me. He calls me to salvation. I responded. He has called me. He calls me to sanctification. And I responded. Now he calls me to the satisfactory fullness of the Spirit of God. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Look at Luke chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 13. In Luke 11 verse 13, if ye then be evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. You must ask him as a gift. You must ask him as the promise he has made. He made promise of eternal life salvation. He fulfilled it. He made the promise of making us holy. If I am God that sanctifies you, he fulfills it. Now he makes the promise of baptizing us, immersing us, enveloping us with the power and the strength of the Spirit of God. And he is a good God, a faithful God. He fulfills his promises in John chapter 7. Reading from verse 37. John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. In verse 38, it says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, out of his innermost being, out of his inner man, shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, it says, But they speak he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now he's glorified, and that power, that strength, that enablement of the Holy Ghost is now for you. It's now for me. It's now for me. And he'll give you everything as you ask him in faith in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two here. Number two is this is H now, Jesus, the high priest, the helper of saints, and of all seekers. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 17. In verse 17, therefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he, Jesus, might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, for he, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, to, sus uh, to sustain, to support them that are tempted. Able. You'll be able in your life. Look at chapter 4, Hebrews. Chapter 4. We're looking at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, 
the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. It refers to Jesus, and he is the great high priest that is passed into the heavens. And in verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like a swear, yet without sin. Verse 16 then encourages us, actually commands us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus, the high priest, the helper of all saints and of all the seekers. Look at three things here. Number one, number one, he is the healer of the sick with his stripes. Number two, he is the heir of all for all sons and servants. Number three, he is the hope of all in submission to him, the son of God. Look at number one, the healer of the sick with his stripes. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he, Jesus, and he, our healer, and he, our redeemer, and he, the one that came to solve the sin problem, the sickness problem, the spirit problem. The one that came to relieve us and to recover us from all sicknesses. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. He'll do it today. I said he will do it today. Look at verse 17. It says that it may be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying he himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. We are told in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. Went about doing good. And it's still the same today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He went about doing good. He's going about this morning. Everywhere he's doing good. He'll get to you there. He will do good in your life. He went about doing good and healing and healing all that are oppressed of, tell me, tell me out aloud of the devil. There are people, whatever is happening to them, who they say is of God. If they have cancer, they say it's God. If they have incurable disease, they say it's God. If there's an accident, they say it's God. If any of their people are drowned in the sea, they say it's God. No. Sickness is not of God. I didn't hear you. Yeah. Cancer is not of God. Incurable disease is not of God. Now, understand. If the sicknesses were of God, and Jesus went about healing them, he'll be walking against the Father. He'll be opposing the Father. He'll be saying, my Father, I know you want them sick, but I disagree with you. I want them well. Jesus 
was never in, the, in disagreement with the Heavenly Father. I and my Father are one. Always in agreement with the Father. So when he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, he was against the devil. It was not against his father. It's God, his father, that anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. And that's why the father sent him all around, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. If he was doing something contrary to the will of the father, God will not be with him. It's like, you know, his son being rebellious to the father. The father says, my son, I'm not with you in this one. It's like a daughter in rebellion to the mother. The mother says, my daughter, I'm not with you in this one. It's when you are doing the will of God. You're in obedience to the father. That God is with you. And Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And the Father and Jesus, they united this morning to bring healing to you in Jesus' name. And look at First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 24. It says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body. On the tree that we being dead to sin, dead to sin, dead to sin. And we were not interested in the imitation of sin anymore. It says, Come, no, I'm out of that class. I've graduated from that. I won't do that. Why don't you do that? Because I'm dead to the sin, and the sin is dead to me. Every born again child of God, every saint of God is dead to sin. And all the sins of the past, all the sinful practices of the past, you are dead to them. If you have met Jesus, if you have come across Jesus, if you are converted by Jesus, if you are renewed, if you are refined, if you are reformed by the blood of Jesus, you are dead, dead to sin. And sin doesn't capture your interest anymore. Sin doesn't capture uh, your will anymore. Your will against every, against every sin. And every sin that comes as temptation, you are dead unto them. It says being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. I am healed. If ye were healed, then you are healed. If he was healed, then he is healed. If I was healed, then today I am healed. Anybody there? I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. By his suffering, I am healed. By his sacrifice, I am healed. The healer of the sick with his stripes. Look at number two here. Number two, the heir. Those who inherit the heir of all false sons and servants. He has inherited everything and inherited that for you and for me. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1. We're looking at verse 2. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir, heir, inheritor of all things, by whom also he made the world. He has now appointed him to inherit all things for you and for me. In Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, verse many, as alleged by the Spirit of God, look at that, as many as alleged by the Spirit of God, there are different kinds of spirit. There's the spirit of the world, 
the spirit of the age, the spirit of the last days. Some people are led by the spirit of the world. There's the spirit of Satan. The people who are led, who are controlled, who are directed by the spirit of the evil one. There is the spirit of the human. The human. We have spirit, we have soul, we have body. There are people who are led by, I think, I feel, I want to, I desire, by the spirit of the weak, of weak humanity. But the spirit of God. Knowing the scripture given by God, he directs us, he controls us in our action, in our attitude, in our character, in our behavior, in our thought, in our planning, in the direction we go in life. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He tells us in verse 15, for ye have not received, look at that, the spirit of bondage. There's a spirit of bondage again to fear. There are people, the people that work, operate by the spirit of the world. They have the spirit of the tyrant. And they want to bring everyone under their own control. And they want you. To look away from the spirit of God and look into the spirit of bondage so that you'll not have the freedom to live the life of the true believer. And they want to bring you in the spirit of bondage by the way they act, the things they say, the actions they perform. If you submit to that, you cannot submit to the spirit of God and the spirit of bondage. At the same time, you have to make your choice. And if you are submissive to the spirit of bondage, you come in bondage back to sin, back to transgression, back to iniquity. And that spirit of bondage will make you to fear every time. You want to set right things that are wrong, Spirit of bondage will bring fear. You want to do restitution. Spirit of bondage will bring fear. You want to turn around and go the right direction in life. The spirit of bondage will bring fear. But it says we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Give me a good amen there. I say that after me. I have not received. The spirit of bondage again to fear. Any minister there, if you're a minister, you fear your congregation, and you fear the king makers, those who appoint uh, pastors, employ pastors, pay pastors, if you're in the spirit of bondage to them, to those king makers in the church, You'll never do the will of God. You'll be operating on the fear. I've learned about Jesus, the all-sufficient Jesus. If I take that to the congregation, I know how they will react. The spirit of bondage will bind your fear. And if you have learned a new life, the new life to live and the direction to go. And then you think, if I do that, I carry this new life to the office, what will the, my colleagues in the office say? Again, you are submitting to the spirit of bondage, to fear. You will not be able to rise up from the ground and do anything, everything. The and the Lord has visited you and is saying this is how to live, this is how to act, and this is where to go. And then you come out from that close set of prayer and the Spirit of God has empowered you, energized you, and you now you come to the place where you are to do what God has called you to do. 
and you look at the people, they're always there. And they come with the spirit of bondage, to fear. Then you are afraid you are not able to declare the whole counsel of God. You will live your life in fear. And your future will be on the other side. God will say, I spoke to you. And you looked up to the people more than you looked up to me. You will not get to that place you thought you are going to. But when you break free from every spirit of bondage. And there is no fear in your heart. Then it says you have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we say, Abba. Father, look at verse 16, and the Spirit bear it witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, and if children, if we're children, then we're heirs, we're heirs of heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ everything Christ has all the possibilities in Christ you also have joint heirs with Christ if so be that ye suffer with him persecution may be there that we may also be glorified together we'll be glorified with the Lord eventually in Jesus name Alpha location, amen. Yeah. Revelation chapter 21, we're looking at verse 7. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, he that overcometh, I will overcome. He that overcometh, I'll overcome temptation. I can't hear you. He that overcometh, I will overcome all trials. You know, all those things that come into your life, they just come to try you to see whether you have become a new creature in Christ or whether you are still the old creature just wearing uh, the plastic or the, or the cast of a new creature. And when they come uh, as trials, thank God you will overcome. Shall inherit all things. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Look at number three here. Number three, he is the hope of all who are in submission to the Son, Christ Jesus, the hope of all in submission. To the Son. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Colossians 1, 27, to whom God would make known what is the rich, what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in your heart, the hope of glory. Christ in your life, the hope of glory. Christ in everything you do is the hope of glory. When you accept Christ, you receive Christ, and you retain Christ in your heart, in your life, and it directs, and it controls you, from the heart, from your spirit, from the inside, Christ in you is the hope of glory. In verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And the only hope that we can be perfect, the only hope that he can take away, cleanse away every imperfection from our lives is Christ dwelling in us. And the apostles said that's why we preach him in fullness. That's why we preach him with freedom. That's why we preach him with faith that he will so abide dwell, remain in us that we, he might perfect everything 
in our lives and that is the hope of glory in first peter chapter one i'm reading from verse three first peter chapter one when you came in at verse three you say blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us that being born again has begotten us again unto a lively hope it's the new birth it's a salvation it's the receiving of eternal life that makes us to have this lively salvation by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead and then in verse 4 it tells us to an inheritance incorruptible to an inheritance undefiled to an inheritance that fadeth not away to an inheritance reserved in heaven for you first john chapter 3 reading from verse 1 in first john chapter 3 verse 1 behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not the world recognizes us not the world honors us not it says we are now the children of god and has bestowed upon us is love the world knoweth us not because it knew him not look at verse 2 in verse 2 it says behold now are we the sons of god now am i a child of god now am i a child of god now am i a child of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him we're looking forward to that we shall be like him but we shall see him as he is look at verse 3 and every man and everyone that has this hope of being there with him being glorified with him, seeing him as he is and becoming like him. Everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself, purifies himself, purifies himself even as he is pure. The hope, the hope of being with Christ, the hope of becoming like Christ, the hope of reigning with Christ belongs to the people that take the privilege, the provision of the blood of the Lamb to purify themselves even as he is pure. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, Jesus, the interpreter. Of scripture to the sightless the people who read the scriptures the sightless they're without perception they're without understanding there are people that read their system of reading the bible from generation from genesis to revelation every year and yet of what they read it doesn't sink into them to make any change, to make any intervention from heaven, to make any translation, and to make any transformation in their lives. They read and read, they're sightless. They do not have the faith to see that promise is mine, that provision is is mine that proclamation of scripture is mine they read but they are sightless and christ is the interpreter of scripture to the sightless look at luke chapter 24 in luke chapter 24 
Reading from verse 27 and beginning at Moses, the books of Moses, and all the prophets, the books of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He interpreted unto them to open their understanding and to put the word as light to their heart that will give them sight to see. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, it says, And the said one to another, Did not our heart burn? They didn't say, Did not our head turn? No. It doesn't turn the head. It burns the heart. Penetrates the heart. Changes the heart. When you actually have Christ, it's a preaching. The word of God unto you. It gets in your heart. It burns in the heart. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? He opened to us the scriptures. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45, then opened he their understanding. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Jesus is the interpreter of the scriptures to the sightless. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the intercessor for our steadfastness and security. It's interceding for us that whatever wind may blow and whatever things may happen, that we will be steadfast and secured in the faith. Number two is the image of splendor shining through the saints. It shines through us and a splendid light and a supernatural light and the spiritual life shines forth in our lives. Number three is the invisible made visible. To surrender saints, surrender souls in supplication. When we come to pray, making supplication before God. The people who pray, they don't have the sense of the nearness of God. It's like they're praying and their prayer does not go beyond the ceiling. But Christ is the invisible one that makes God visible to those who are surrendered and submissive to him when they are in supplication. Look at number one. Number one, the intercessor for our steadfastness and security. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He saves, he secures, he makes them steadfast in that salvation, and he makes them to shine forth with the light of the gospel because he is ever living to make intercession for them. Look at verse 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, and defiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He is the intercessor, and he's pleading for you, praying for you, before the Father in heaven. 
Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 34. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who is he that condemned it? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen, and who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. What a joy. What confidence we have to know that we'll go through safely, that we'll go through soundly, because Christ is by the right hand side of God, and he maketh intercession for you. For me. You will not fail. You will not fall. You will not faint. Because there is the Jesus, your Savior, who has also now seated on the right hand side of God and is making a intercession for you. When Christ was here on earth, he said, Father, I know that you hear me always. Now, it's right there by the right hand of the Heavenly Father. If when he was on earth, the Father always heard him, how much more? Now, seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, making intercession for you, the Lord God in heaven will answer his prayer concerning you. When he answers the prayer, what happens? Look at verse 35. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 36. In verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake, are we killed all the day long? We are accounted a sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. Nay, in all these things, I am more than a conqueror. Through him that loved me. I lost your voice. Look at verse 38. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, Hold on. Sometimes you have a dream. And there are some queer things you saw in the dream. And it's like those queer things, strange things. When you wake up in the morning, you think of them rather than thinking of Jesus, your intercessors. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. No weapon from any direction. From the bottom of the sea, from the depths of the wilderness of the bush, and from the skies and the abode of the principalities of powers, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you shall be condemned by the great judge of heaven. Because your righteousness is of him. That's why it says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come. Verse 39, no height, no depth, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Amen. Amen. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He makes intercession for us. In John 
chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them. Purify them. Purge them. Transform them. Send the fire from heaven to burn every chaff, useless thing from their lives. Purify their hearts. Sanctify them. He's praying for us. That's intercession. Through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He prayed for our sanctification. We're coming to number two. He is, number two, the image of splendor shining through saints. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, all the children of God, we all, all the people of God, we all, all saved souls, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed, are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. You'll be going up, you'll not go down. You'll be going forward, you'll not go backward. Because as we're beholding, as we learn of him, he changes us from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. In Romans chapter 8, Reading from verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's he wants, what he wants of us. He wants us to be conformed not to the heroes of the world. He wants us to be conformed not to the people of the world in the same profession with us. You know, the people who are trained in the same profession with us, this is how they do. No, you cannot be conformed to them. You don't have the perfect image of Christ before them in everything they do. And you are to be conformed to the image of his son. His attitude, his character, his action, everything that he did. He says that we might be conformed unto the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at number three here. Number three is the invisible that makes visible. To those who are surrendered, submissive to him in supplication. The invisible made visible. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible. Invisible, invisible. The only wise God, the honor, and glory forever and ever. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, when you have a task, when you have an assignment, when you have a responsibility, when you have a duty to carry out, but the duty, the assignment is enormous. And the thing or the people that are visible to you, they're the people that will say, please, Moses, don't bring that here. Let my people go. That they may submit Moses, please. If you love your life, 
these people have been captives of my authority for hundreds of years. And you come and you want to say, release all these servants. I will not release them. Moses said, God sent me to you. Let my people go. He said, I don't know that God now. If you come to that situation, Pharaoh is visible. The tyrant is visible. The one that wants to prevent you from going forward is visible. And if your God is invisible and your enemy is visible, you concentrate on what that enemy, what that tyrant, what that despot, and what that pharaoh is saying because he is the only one visible to you. But if you are going to do the impossible, which you will do, if you are going to do the incredible, which you will do, if you are going to do the unprecedented, which you are going to do by the grace of God, you must have the invisible to become visible unto you. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 27. Hebrews 11, verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt. By faith, he forsook everything, even the despot tyrant in Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured a seeing him who is invisible. He saw his God all the time. He remembered the burning bush all the time. He heard, he retained the voice of God all the time. Before Pharaoh, he didn't see the Pharaoh, he saw the invisible. Before the magicians, he didn't see the magicians, he saw the invisible. Before the Red Sea, he didn't see the Red Sea, he saw the invisible. And when you come to prayer like that today, you don't see your sickness, you don't see your problem, you don't see the devil, you don't see the demons, you see the invisible. I said you see the invisible. And the invisible God will show up and break every yoke in your life. And everything that stands in your way to do you what God wants you to do. The invisible will be made visible to you and everything in your life will be all right. Are you going to pray from the death of your heart? Not praying as usual because the usual prayer, we see the problem, we're crying. We see the problem, we're screaming. We see the problem and it's like, you know, we're ready. We're ready, emptied out. It's like nothing. Nothing. Nothing can happen. But when you come to pray with a different mind, and by faith, you can forsake everything you have learned in Egypt. Everything you have known in Egypt. Not fearing the wrath of the king. But you pray and you endure in prayer. As seeing the invisible. Great, great manifestations of miracles will happen in your life. The Israelites that Pharaoh said will not go out, they'll come out of bondage. And the Red Sea that said they will not move forward, the Red Sea were clear before you. And all the Amalekites in the land, in the wilderness, that blocked them, and the Balaam and the Balak wanting to stop them, you will go through every difficulty and every challenge, Balak will be forgotten. Balaam will be forgotten and will see you on the other side. You even cross the river Jordan. The Jericho walls will fall. You'll be in the land of promise in Jesus' name. I will be there. I will be there. 
Why don't you rise up and now come with the faith in this all sufficient Jesus so that you will have everything he has ordained for you to have. Open your mouth now and talk to the Lord in prayer.